Welcome to this week's Man Enough podcast presented in partnership with P&G, the maker of brands like Tide, Swiffer, Mr. Clean, Pantene, and Braun. Hello, and welcome to the Man Enough podcast. I am Justin Baldoni, your co-host here with one of my best friends in the world, Mr. Jamie Heath. That's me. By the way, how freaking cool is it that we're doing a podcast together? You threw me into it last minute. I didn't really throw you. You kind of threw minute. me in, under the bus with this one, but. Under the bus? Not under the bus, I guess on the I think bus. the point, well, the point of you being on the podcast is to throw me under the bus. That is what I intend to do, my friend. See, I think everybody in the world needs to have a friend like Jamie Heath. Because right, totally. because Jamie Heath will always tell me the truth. We You're both. like the opposite of a yes man. You're like a no, here's how you can grow man. This particular episode that we're about to go into, you talk, you talk to Karamo. From Netflix's Queer Eye. Karamo, man, he's such an interesting guy. He has this very unique ability to move through the world and to see his own weaknesses, mm -hmm. to see his own strengths, to call them out and then to do the work, which is something that's very rare. Mm. He comes from um, a, a broken home may not be the right word, but you know he had a father that mm. um, uh, didn't treat his mom the best and mm. didn't treat him the best. And um, I'm sure we'll ask him about that. And he's very open about his struggles. And I just think that's something that a lot of men can learn from because we're not taught to be open. We're not taught to share. We're not mm. taught to lean on each other. Because we're, we're taught that if we open up and we share, then that thing can be used against us. Okay. That's why men have a harder time going to therapy than women. Because mm. um, it's like, it's, it's uncomfortable for us. It's like, it's like jumping into a cold plunge. <laughs> yeah, you just... You have to like psych yourself up to be able to be vulnerable. Whereas, and this is not generalizing, but in many ways, women have been socialized to share. Whereas men have been socialized to keep things in. And fake it. And Karamo is an example of a man who has now built a platform by sharing and he's now helping others mm. along the way. And that's why I wanted to have him on the podcast. Beautiful. All right, stick around. We'll be right back with Karamo Brown. Our amazing partner, PNG, aspires to build a better world where boys and girls, men and women of all backgrounds and abilities can learn, grow, succeed, and thrive with equal access and opportunity. Gender bias and stereotypes can get in the way of us truly seeing and treating each other as equals. This shows up everywhere. It's in our homes, it's in our schools, and it's in our workplaces. P&G, the maker of brands like Tide, Swiffer, Mr. Clean, Pantene, and Braun, is dedicated to supporting communities like ours, like Man Enough, where we undefine masculinity. See, undefining masculinity can help us create a more gender equal world where everyone has a shot at achieving their dreams. Now, our conversations on this show can become uncomfortable, but they cover a broad range of topics with guests sharing so many different points of view. And those points of view are so important because having these uncomfortable conversations with influential people is so important, not just for the betterment of men, but for the entire world as a whole community. So thank you, PNG, for stepping up as a force for good in the world. Visit pggoodeveryday.com to learn more. Hello, and welcome back to the Man Enough Podcast. I am Justin Baldoni, and I am here with one of my best friends in the world, Jamie Heath, and my wonderful co-host and friend, Liz Plank, author of For the Love of Men, mm -hmm. which is an amazing book that uh, helped me a lot, personally, and also jewelry designer uh, with her awesome, she's wearing her, what does that say? Let what does that boys say? cry. Why? Let boys why, cry. Why did you design a jewelry line that says let boys because cry? Because we don't let them cry. So then they hurt and then they, you know, hurt people, hurt people. So we should let boys love. We should let boys cry. Mm. We should let boys be feel. human. Let yeah, boys let feel. boys feel. That should be the next collection. And I'm so happy that we're doing this together. How cool Me is too. this? Because I've been following you forever and I love that we're uh, now, like, how cool are you? you get to like, we're doing a podcast together it's, we're, about I men. I think we're doing a podcast together. You love I think men. this is happening. I love, I love men. men. I am a man. Yes, you are a man. And speaking of men, uh, that we, we love. have an amazing man on the show today. Yes, Cromwell Brown. I'm so thrilled um, to have him today. He actually started his career in 2004 on MTV's reality show, The Real World. You may have heard of it. Um, Philadelphia. And he became the first openly gay black man 
to be cast in a reality show. I didn't know Isn't that, that wild? Isn't that wild? I watched wild? that season. I still can't believe that was this. That's the same Karamo. That's the same Karamo. He's been through a lot. He's now on this small show, Queer Eye, on Netflix. Oh, Have never you heard, heard of it. it? Yeah. No, never heard of it. Um, it's doing well. I hope apparently. it wins an Emmy or something one day. I hope so too. And he is also the son of immigrants. He um, has an amazing organization called Six in Ten dot org that um, helps LGBTQ youth. He also, mm. on the side, worked with the Obama administration, as as one does, I guess. Um, and he also did not get angry at me when I asked him for a selfie, which... Uh, yeah, I need to hear about... So you, I need to hear about this. So you guys met. We met. Ed, well, Here let's talk about it. Hey! hey. <laughs> What's up, man? <laughs> you let me take a selfie with you in 30 Rock in a green room. And in the selfie, because I was so excited to meet you, I put my hand right on my heart and I was wearing like a ring and it looks like an engagement photo. Like you, you are, and, and I fooled a lot of people into thinking maybe, so maybe we'd been I, engaged. I think this is the moment that we should announce yes. that we this are engaged. This is what engaged. this is for. Stop it. Yes. This is a non-sexual, <laughs> consensual relationship. That's where... all I want. Yeah, That's we'll just support each other, go out to eat. Is it weird know? that I'm kind of jealous? <laughs> you can join. It, I... there, we can include as many, right? This is an yeah, open situation. I'm open situation. to it. Polyamory. <laughs> We're going to be the most non-sexual, polyamorous yes. relationship. Of all time. <laughs> of all time. That's on my bucket list. So I'm excited you're here with us. Um, yeah. Thank you so much for joining us today. Of course. And I got to say, I do remember meeting you like no. um, immediately. I promise you, I remember your face. I just no. remember you, how sweet you were and how kind you were. I also remember that rock. Um, and so, <laughs> <laughs> you know, you don't see bling like that, that often like that at 30 Rock. So I'm like, oh, oh. oh. I'm so excited we get to actually sit down with you today and, and really go on, go on a deep dive. I just am so grateful that you are here willing to share your heart because I think, well, I mean, look, you do it for a living. But you, I believe, can help so many and already help so many people feel like they are enough. And at oh, its core, that's really what this is. That's what this podcast is, is our journey from our head to our heart. Everything that you stand for is what we you know, hope to stand for. So thank you for living with such sincerity and authenticity. I, I appreciate that, Justin, sincerely, and I receive that. And um, one of the reasons that we connected is because you live the same way. And what I've noticed since I've come into this Hollywood world in the past six years is that you often don't meet a lot of people who are willing to be vulnerable, to be honest. Um, uh, a lot of them are just leading by ego. It's all mm. about like, let me put up whatever image I can, because I'm afraid that if you see the real me, that I'm not gonna get the job that I want. I'm not mm. gonna really get the relationship I want. Mm. And what I appreciate about our conversations where it was always like, this is me. Um, success could come or go, but as long as I never lose me. And that's the same mantra I sort of try to live by and thrive and thrive through. And so um, I'm just glad to be here as well. Well then should we dive in? Yeah. All right. When was the last time you didn't feel man enough? Ooh, um, it gets, it happens at these weird spurts that I don't expect them to happen mm. where all of a sudden, they, all of a sudden there's some narrative that came from what I was taught as a child of what it is to be a man. Mm. Um, that is the, one of those subconscious small things that I then find myself, um, in acting now as an adult. Can you think um, of a, can you think of an example? example? Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, prime example is growing up, my father was not the best example of what it is to be a man. Mm -hmm. And um, and I say that in, in the sense of like, he was abusive to my mother, there was a lot of addiction, um, he was bad with finances, he was, I mean, just a lot of things, he wasn't vulnerable, I never saw him like really show emotion, all of these different things. Um, but one of the things that as I'm now a single man and embarking on new relationships, is he was also um, secretive. He was um, mm -hmm. secretive and played games. And I started to find myself in a relationship recently being secretive about something because I thought that would make me look sexy or more manly. And especially these these things that you hear from, you know, women on TV sometimes that like the man that's the sexiest is the mysterious, mysterious guy. Mysterious, exactly. He shares, mm. sexiest, sexier he is. And I find myself feeling that way. And I had to stop myself and say, 
oh, you know what? I, I, this this is making me feel like I'm not man enough because I'm being too open and vulnerable. So let me pull back. Let me not share who I truly am. Let me not share things. Um, and then I had to stop myself in that moment and say, no, 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 no. What it is to be man enough, what it is to be healthy in this relationship is for me to continue on being vulnerable and being honest and being open and not being afraid of someone else's thoughts about me because their thoughts don't define me. Mm. Only my truth and my actions can define me. And so that's one of the last times recently that I felt mm. like I wasn't man enough and had to fight against that quickly. Mm. It's, it's oh, I, one, one, one quick thing. So in a, and this is, this is ignorance, complete yeah. ignorance. I know as a man in a relationship with a woman, that is something that I for sure have felt. I've even experienced that with my wife, Emily, right? Mm -hmm. In our dating life. Like I should, should I not share this? Should I share this? Is it better mm -hmm. to be mysterious? That same thing applies in a gay relationship with two men where both, men, both men are thinking mm -hmm. the same thing. Definitely. I mean, we're, as, as men, I think sexuality um, aside, we are consciously and subconsciously, as you know, taught all of these secret messages that come and play. It's the same thing that happens to women on the other side, you know what I mean, of like how their beauty standards and their bodies and how they reflect with themselves. And I think on the opposite side, what I love about your conversations is that we're taught these things. And so now you have two men who are not who are not who are a, a bit toxic as men now mm. who identify as gay who didn't start off as toxic men they were you know innocent boys trying to figure out how to navigate this world mm. and now we both absorb these messages that have told us to act a certain way yeah. mm. and unless one of us is healthier because what i love and appreciate about most of my girlfriends is that normally with the men um they unfortunately have to take on this responsibility of being like okay Come on, be more vulnerable, yeah. be more honest. I, I I love this, you know, and showing them and guiding them how to be sexy. Liz is, yeah. Liz is nodding her I'm head. Nodding, I'm nodding, yeah. I'm nodding, yeah. yes. I mean, you know what I'm I, mean you know what I'm I interviewed so many women for, for the for a book about men where, where they told me, I don't feel married to a man. I feel like a rehab center for a man, right? That they were the therapist, they were the mom, they were yeah. the babysitter, right? And and I think what you're saying is so crucial because, and I talked to a lot of gay men for the book as well, who would say, yeah, think about all of the toxic ideals that we have about masculinity. That's one person. Then add another person. It's like the way that you bring your baggage, right? Like yeah. a relationship is you write about it in the book. Yeah. Here's my shit. Here's your shit. Now we have twice the shit. Um, it's the exactly. same thing with masculinity, right? Yep. With, with, with yeah. two men. Yeah, and we don't have, and it should never be the responsibility of women, whether you're in a sexual relationship, intimate relationship, or just a friendship to teach us as men, but it does get a little bit more compounded and confusing when it comes to two men together. Mm. Um, and, and it just, it, it, it does suck sometimes because for me, I end up taking that role often of saying, okay, we have to step back. We have to figure out how we're communicating. We have to reevaluate. And it gets exhausting mm. to constantly challenge mm. those things. But it happens in gay relationships very, very often. Right. And you even talk about your dad, right? That you saw your dad, and, and you just mentioned it, be abusive to your mother. But then, uh, so you knew how to not treat women. But you forgot, yeah, right? But then it's like, oh, when I'm in a relationship with a man... Am I applying that, that same apply? level? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Oh my gosh, when I was younger, um, in my 20s, um, I, was, I was 18, 19, 20, even though I was in school, I was the one that was a fighter. I, I fought for all my friends physically, not just verbally. Um, if they needed somebody, I was big, I was gonna step up, I fought. Um, and luckily, um, you know, never ch challenge somebody who <laughs> could knock my teeth out. And I don't say that proudly. I say that like <laughs> what luck I had because I was that arrogant little, you know, mm. um, shit that was like, oh my gosh. But the thing was that when I started getting into long-term relationships with men, I, I was abusive at first wow. because I would realize wow. that I was exhibiting the same behavior that my um, mm. father had you became my mother. Your dad. There, yeah, I became my dad. But there, here was a catch for me as a gay man is that until recently, and we're still not there yet, most police officers, um, most firemen, most first responders don't have not been trained on how to handle gay relationships or mm. LGBT relationships. So they usually dismiss violence against 
mm-hmm. two men in domestic violence relationships and they just say, no, 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 yeah. uh, you, you two figure it out. You know, it's mm-hmm. sort of like if there was a male and a female and the female was there, they would say, OK, we're handcuffing you. We're taking you in. But in gay relationships, they don't happen. And so there was an arrogance in me where I knew I, I, I tell the story of my book that there was a time that I was you know, fighting with one of my exes, it got physical. Um, mm. and he was bleeding from me hitting him in the mouth. And I'm not proud of any of these stories. I'm sharing them so someone else can hopefully grow. And he called the police and I was like, Oh, you called the police. I'll go downstairs and wait for them. <laughs> and I went to the door and I waited for them to show up and then aggressively to the police officer. And this is now talking about a black man yeah. talking to police like this. Mm-hmm. But my arrogance was so much, I, I, I took away the race, I took away all this stuff. And I was I was just so arrogant in the fact that like, you don't know how to, you have never been trained on this. You don't know how to handle domestic violence between two men. Yeah. And so you're gonna do exactly what I'm gonna tell you to do because you feel like these are just two men, I don't wanna get involved. Mm-hmm. And they did exactly that. My boyfriend was there, he was sitting there hurt, in pain. And I was like, yo, he started it. You know, we got into a tussle, whatever, whatever. And they were like, hey, you two guys figure it out. And my boyfriend is sitting there. This is the ex was sitting there like, I need help. I'm in an abusive relationship. Mm -hmm. And these police officers were like, no. Mm -hmm. And I say that to say that there are there are more police officers, first responders that are getting trained. But I think anyone who's in an LGBT or a gay relationship or same gender loving relationship needs to understand that first of all, domestic violence does happen. You need to label it. You need to understand that it doesn't make you more of a man. Mm -hmm. If you're able to exhibit, you know, um, your strength through violence or through verbally or physically, and that you really need to, if you're in that relationship, know that there's so much support systems out there for you that can say, you're not, you're not weaker because you're leaving. You're not weaker because you're finding, Mm -hmm. you know, help it makes you actually stronger that you're putting yourself first. Mm -hmm. And I just want to put that message out there for someone who could be in a gay relationship or same gender gender loving relationship and doesn't know what Mm -hmm. to do or doesn't have the courage. Mm. Wow. Yeah. You are listening to the Man Enough podcast. We will be right back. I believe that expectations based on gender, which so many of us have heard since we were children, are at the root of so many of society's illnesses today. Now, I want to change that for my children's generation and their children's generation. And the way to do that is with uncomfortable conversations. My personal journey started with me looking in the mirror first and then talking with my friends, friends like Jamie and Liz. Now, over the years, we've had a lot of uncomfortable conversations, many of which I look back on now and cringe, but that means that I'm a better person today because of the conversations I had yesterday, because I was willing to sit in that discomfort and listen. I wanna keep having those conversations and becoming a better human, and then share those conversations with the world through the Man Enough podcast. Our partner P&G, the maker of brands like Tide, Swiffer, Mr. Clean, Pantene, and Braun, shares that mission of creating a more equal world, a more just and equitable world, where boys and girls, men and women, can all have equal access and opportunity to learn, grow, succeed, and thrive. I am so grateful for their partnership in bringing these conversations to light. Together, we can create a better world. All we gotta do is stay in the room. Visit pggoodeveryday.com to learn more about how P&G aims to make it easier to create a better, tomorrow. All right. Welcome back to the Man Enough podcast. One of the things I love about this journey Mm -hmm. is I'm here to learn and I don't think I've thought about that. It's not something, you know, I have my blinders on, right? I'm a straight white guy. So all of these things that happen in the periphery are just things that happen that I don't necessarily have to learn about. And so just the thought that, wow, somebody can be really hurt, and yeah. because they're because he's a dude, or they're both they're two dudes, mm-hmm. a police officer is gonna be like, oh, you mm-hmm. guys, yeah, you, mm-hmm. you guys handle it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Ha- happens be, more than you know. Yeah. Girl pair, right? Yeah. It's like, right. And, yeah. and and that's also rooted in like this idea that men should be violent or can be harmed and don't need to be protected, right? This mm-hmm. idea it's rooted in yeah. in this, you know sort of, again, ideal of masculinity almost that hurts like, Almost everyone. like the police officer looks at the guy who called the police and, mm-hmm. and is like, 
are you seriously calling the yes. police? Like, oh, poor you, right. poor baby, right? right? Like, right. that's exactly. you're gonna waste yes. my time. Yeah. You got yes. hit. Yeah. You're, you yes. got hit by your boyfriend. You're gonna waste my time, yes. kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. it's so yeah. offensive. Like, like, man up and fight yeah. back. Yes, that right. was that's that's that the, was the response in that entire relationship that the police always gave us was like, man up. Mm. It, it's 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 your fault. It was yeah. like blaming the victim yeah. instead of like seeing that there was two people here. One, first of all, that was being abused that needed the help. And then secondly, that there need to be more training. Yeah. Um, but not to switch gears a little bit. Can I say something to you, Justin, that um, this is going to sound crazy, even though we are friends. Until I read your book, I didn't know you were white. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not what did you think I was? I'm, I thought you were like... <laughs> Um, maybe there was some like Native American in there. I thought there was maybe like some Indian in there. I thought mm. like maybe it's, it's, it's the long curly black hair, yeah. the d- dark eyes. I was like, oh, he's Latino from somewhere. Like he's like you know, someone's, I, I just promise you, I did not know you were white. You've had every nationality, you. right? Well, like, hold on, hold on. Karamo. Yes. <laughs> it's a white dude right here. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just Brother, get that. I did not know. I'm serious. That's crazy. But now that you know, there's a white dude right I, there. He's a, he's how a, do you he, know? How do you know? Um, read his book, Walk How He Walks Through the World. <laughs> he will. Uh, when I heard you say that, which I understand, I just had to set the record straight. That this boy right <laughs> here. Um, there's, there's been enough times where Jamie's had to say, Did you seriously not see that? How did you not see that? <laughs> Are your eyes closed? Are you blind? Justin, you can't say that. <laughs> We've know. been through all so, of it. So, Jamie, well, Jamie and I have been I, through I, all I can't, of it. I can't be the only one. I can't be the only one who thought, Justin, that you no. that you were of some other... No, you're not. Yeah, no, you're not. That's true. That's yeah. true. You're not the only well, one. Well, you're not. I mean, th- we made a joke, as in the book we talk about, I got... Like, one of my first jobs as an actor was I got cast as an Iraqi prince. <laughs> so I walked, I walked into this room. I was 20 years old. I walk into this room, and there's all these Middle Eastern guys auditioning for this like prince role and I am the white guy that walks in and I get it and then they dub my voice. They put, they literally added mm. in a, a real Middle Eastern Iraqi guy's voice to, and, and I was so excited. I, was t- I told my family, everybody was watching and then they watch and there's like this, you know, 40 year old, mm. you know, a real Iraqi voice that they put over mine. So they used my white face that kind of could pass off as Middle Eastern. Mm. Yeah. With, with a, and, you know, and that was like my entry point to Hollywood, yeah. which is which was yeah. like, oh, well, oh, I'm whatever you think I am. Right. right. I used to make jokes like, oh, I didn't know I was, I didn't know I was Spanish mm. until I moved to Hollywood because I was always auditioning for Latin mm. roles. And you talk so much about that whitewashing in Hollywood, right? And, There's and, so much. And the consequences of it. I'm going to ask you a question because you said something earlier and I just want to touch back on it. Sure. You were talking about... Um, your experience as a gay man, not only as a gay man, but as a black gay man. Yeah. And what we're trying to do ultimately is we're trying to um, understand how men can make a difference in the world so that everybody is better, right? It's not just so that mm-hmm. we can like do things just to do things. What is our role in humanity? How have we held back the progress of society? And what are the awarenesses? So my question to you is, as a black gay man, why do you think it's important that we have these discussions and undefine these things? Why is that important for the advancements of humanity? I I mean, because the thing is, is that we're passing on these messages and we're passing on these ideals that are just hurting us as men, hurting our our families, hurting our communities over and over again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, one of the things that I know to be true is that if I'm the problem, I have to also be the solution. I can't allow mm. someone else to feel like they're the solution. And that is, it's critical for us to be the ones mm. that started this and stop it. Mm. And that's how it has to go. Everything starts with yourself. You know what I mean? My man. Um, that's the first thing they'll teach you in therapy. Yeah. Before we start talking about someone else's yeah. baggage, yep. can we unpack what's going on with you and why you're dealing with the certain things and why you mm. are living your life mm. a certain way? It's like, if you are a person who identifies as a man, then you need to check how you're thinking and walking through this world because most likely your actions are hurting others, which is inadvertently hurting you. And so I just love that we're doing this. I wanna jump into something that I feel like I can't just gloss over it. Um, Cause it's rare, I think, to hear somebody say they were an abuser. Mm. And, I, mm. and I, I just can't even, count on one hand how many times I've ever heard somebody say that outside of maybe, you know, like a meeting or something. Uh, Yeah. So, okay. So you, 
admitted to being an abuser in some ways to your previous boyfriends. Your father yeah. abused your mother. Um, mm -hmm. What does that journey to healing look like for you and to redemption in, in some way? Because, you know, we live in an age where we tend to classify somebody that has done that once as that forever, right? And that's just yeah. the way that we act. Like, you know, so the idea is, you know, if if it came out that you had hit a woman, right? It'd be Karamo, the abuser, and that's it for the rest of your life, right? But for yeah. some reason, it's different if you hit a man. Um, yeah. And I'm just curious and, what what that journey is and what that looks like and, and how do you how do you heal that in yourself and where are you at with that now? Um, well, I can tell you now probably um, my past relationship I was in for 10 years, there was no physical, emotional, mental abuse. Um, I, you know, I gave that up in my, my twenties. Um, and so the first thing was, is that it is this admission because I think so many times as men, we're afraid to admit the parts of ourselves that we need to heal from and grow through to be better for ourselves mm -hmm. and for our families. And, yep. um, I had to admit, I, and it was, it was a funny thing is because I, I ironically didn't admit the physical abuse first. I ironically was able to admit the emotional abuse um, first. Mm -hmm. And I think that people need to recognize that, especially men of like, you might not be a physical abuser. You might not have never have ever hit the woman or man you're with or the person you're with, but you might be someone who tears them down yeah. unconsciously, you know, says things that are hurting them. Um, that, that you think that the intention is, you know, you're like, that's not my intention. And so you get defensive. You're like, you know, well, I said this, but that wasn't my intention. You're, you're too sensitive. You're taking it wrong. I don't know how many people hearing this can relate to yeah. someone being in a relationship with them where they say that. Um, and that's emotional abuse. That's yeah. manipulation. That's emotional abuse. And so I first had to realize, oh my gosh, like, it doesn't matter what my intention is. It's what the impact is. Oh, and yeah. if the impact is harmful, my intention, mm. it doesn't matter anymore. Doesn't matter. Because mm. it's how it's received by the other person. And it was very immediate that I had to realize that, like, oh, my gosh, check what you're saying. Mm. And, I, and I, I would do this simple exercises where something I would say to someone else, after I would say it and I would see how they would receive it, um, this is the early stages of me understanding me being an emotionally abusive person is that I would then go into the mirror and I'd say it to myself mm. and I'd say it to myself over and over again. Yeah. And I would see if it would like start to affect my self-esteem. And if you say something to yourself in the mirror or you even record it on your phone and you start to see that it, it makes you a little mad, it starts to piss you off, whatever. And you think to yourself, well, if I said it, I probably don't feel that way. I'm mm -hmm. telling you, if you hear it on repeat or say it on repeat, after a while, it will unconsciously start to seep in and affect you. And that was the first gauge for me to know, oh, these words do have a negative impact. Mm -hmm. And so even though it's not my intention, I need to stop every time because I know how it made me feel. Like I said, again, it starts and it stopped with me. It had, it's had to start with me and I had to hear it and apply it to myself or to stop with me. Once I realized I was emotionally abusive, um, I, I started to say that I was, and then I regretted it. Because then it was like everything I said, people hold, held me to the standard of like, oh, look, you're being emotionally abusive. And I realized mm. that didn't help me grow. Mm. That only made me more defensive because I was like, oh, now, oh, so now you're just bringing that up. Because right now we're just having a conversation, you're bringing that up. Mm. And so I had to check, what was that in my ego? What was that about me not being able to receive criticism, um, positive criticism, somebody helping me to reflect that was stopping me from saying, oh, okay, I'm still doing it. Mm -hmm. And so it took me a while to even grow through that. Mm -hmm. And then I was able to then say, I'm physically abusive as well. Because you would think that it'd be the opposite, that I could admit that I was physically abusive first, but admitting that I was physically abusive meant that I was my father. And mm -hmm. I couldn't admit that I was my father. So it was easier for me to admit that I was emotionally abusive than admitting that I was my father mm -hmm. by saying I was mm -hmm. physically abusive. Mm -hmm. um, and so I just, I, I just tell everyone that journey takes some time. It took me maybe about two to three years from the first time I realized I was an abuser to the time that I stopped abusing and started getting help and reading books and seeing a therapist um, and seeing a counselor and talking about it more openly. It took time. And even today, I have to consciously check 
the words that are coming out of my mouth. I'm, I'm really able to navigate my anger. So now my anger doesn't go from zero to a hundred like it used to. Mm-hmm. I also um, understood that there's better ways to communicate what I'm feeling through instead of physical violence. Um, I started to look back at like days that I played football and I know that I got more praise when I hit somebody or made them in pain yeah. or like they, if they were on the field and they couldn't get up, I, I got praise for that instead yeah. of being like, well, you play too hard right there. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, uh, you know, check yourself. And so I started to have to go back and checking myself on all these things. And so it was a lot of like going backwards to heal forward. Mm. And um, that was like the steps for me. And I'm still there today. You know, it's a constant checking of myself of like, hey, how do I make sure I'm not going to do this behavior in this new relationship? It's so interesting because I think we train women not to become abused, but we don't train men not to become abusers. And not that obviously all men become abusers, but to your point with football, sports, and even the way that we sort of train men to be in the world, right? That you're not supposed to ask for directions. You're not supposed to say if you did something wrong. You're not, if you apologize, you're the weak one, right? All well, you're of these, congratulated for, y- for knocking somebody out. You're it, congratulated. Exactly. You're, more of a man. you're congratulated exactly. for leveling the dude in the football field, right? right? You're congratulated. Right. Like, you know, I was a soccer player. So when I got a red card, even though it sucked, there was a part of me that was like, well, fuck yeah, I'm a man. <laughs> like, exactly. Not, and, and even exactly. though it was break, even though it's breaking, you know, the rules of the game, mm. there's, there's like a level of like, you know, respect among men right. when you are violent, you know, when you yeah. are someone that's not to be messed mm-hmm. with, right? But even the way that we, what you were just saying, even the way we talk about women, right? Like she was raped. Oh yeah. Versus yeah. like he raped, he her. raped her, right? Yeah. All of it yeah. is all yeah. of it is backwards. Yeah. But but on the but on the abuser thing, here's here's I have one more question for you. So sure. do you think do you think that men who abuse or who are abusers can change and if they can change um what do you want to say to any men listening right now who maybe haven't come to terms with the fact that they are emotional or physically abusive who maybe came from abusive families who were abused you know who were one in you know one in five boys who were abused before the age of eight um or who had fathers who were abusive or mothers Mm -hmm. what do you say to those men um who are in it right now who have that anger, who don't have an outlet, who don't know what to do with it, who are too proud to go and seek help with a therapist, who, yeah. you know, who are trapped, right, in the in the mask of masculinity, in the man box. What do you say to those yeah. men? Well, I think the first thing, and this is not to generalize, is that for any guy that is buried beneath all of these feelings of anger and of sadness and hurt, that's causing you to lash out against someone else. Uh, Reframe your mind and realize that you're actually not buried underneath that pain. You're actually planted in that pain. And anything that is planted can grow. Mm. And so if you find yourself feeling this way, understand that that means that you can grow through this. So that's the first step. It's just remembering, reminding yourself daily, like, I can actually go through this. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not defined by all these feelings. I'm not defined by these actions that I've done in my past. But the second thing is immediately amends. Amends has to happen. You have to be able to make amends for all of your actions, which means this is where empathetic listening, which is a key skill that I think more men need to adapt and really learn, is that you need to make amends. That means you have to listen to what someone else says without defense and without a rebuttal. And so if, to make amends, if you think, and even if you think, at small inclination, most of the time, men who are abusers or individuals who are abusers know they've been a- abusing someone else emotionally or physically. They know it. They see the other person crying. They know what they're doing. But you have to make amends, even if you feel a small thing, by going to that person saying, I'm sorry for what I've done. Please tell me in your words how I've made you feel. And when they tell you, don't get defensive. Just say, I'm sorry. That's the key thing, being yeah. empathetic. Listen to what they say and just say, I'm sorry. There's not a button there. There's not a, oh my gosh, well, I didn't mean it this way. Again, intention and impact, very important things for someone to learn. Um, and so once you can make those amends, the third thing you have to know is that you can't change until you leave that relationship. Because yeah. people try to change their wow. abusive behavior within the relationship that they've already started being abusive in. And that's not possible in my point of view. Mm-hmm. Because wow. the thing is, is that you're going to fall back into those patterns eventually. Mm-hmm. And this is where, this is why we put the, um, which is the 
unfortunate and disgusting part of like when we talk about that language, while we say to women, um, why didn't you leave? Mm. <laughs> um, mm-hmm. And the real problem is, is not why didn't she leave? She didn't leave because she was scared and she has someone who's manipulating her behavior mm-hmm. and her attitudes and all these other things. The real question should be to him of being like, why didn't yeah. you leave? if you really did want to be better? Why didn't you leave so that you could stop this Mm -hmm. behavior? Mm -hmm. And the thing is is that the the men who say, okay, I want to change, have to understand that they have to release this relationship. It doesn't mean they have to release it for the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. Maybe you can grow and heal and then come back later when you're both healthier. But in that moment, if you know there's abuse, Mm -hmm. you have to leave. Mm -hmm. You've already done the damage of hurting the other person, of of knocking their self-esteem down. It's not up to this other person to have to find the courage through all the BS you put them through. It's up to you to man up. And I'm using it in this sense, you yeah. know, sorry. It's up to you to man up and say, I need to leave yeah. because I'm the one who did wrong here. Mm-hmm. I'm the one who's been hurting you. I don't need to put this onus on you to find courage to escape. I need to do it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was key. So with my exes, it was like, I think they would have probably stayed. I got the to chills. Be very honest with you. I got the chills. I mean, <laughs> it's what Oof. you're saying is so important. Wow. We need such a yeah. reframing of this conversation. I think it was reframing. FKA Twigs who who you know re- responded to Gail King. Gail King, you know, said, "I know we don't. I don't. I don't like asking this, but like, why did you stay?" And she says, "We have to stop asking women. Stop why asking did you stay? You have to say why was it so bad yeah. that you couldn't leave." And I uh, was in an abusive relationship and I remember feeling that same thing where I was like, why aren't you letting me go? Like, why are yeah. you staying in, in and hurting the person that you say you love? Like, you should be yeah. the one <laughs> we should be asking, yeah. you know, w- yeah. what's wrong with you? Um, yeah, so I, I appreciate what you're saying so much. Um, it's, 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 misery loves company and, yeah. and misery, misery also in relationships, unfortunately, uh, because of the way that we've been trained as men, we feel like if I have the power, then I'm a man because yeah. men are supposed to have the power. You know what I mean? Mm. And I saw this amazing TikTok the other day that was like, um, this girl was like, if you want me to stay in the kitchen and go back to these like fifties, you know, gender roles, yeah. then I need you to work 60 hours. Yeah. I need go you to go to war. I saw it. I love war. it. I love I need, it. I need, I need you to, I need you to do <laughs> oh, all man, this I, stuff. I missed it. And it was an amazing thing. It was like, if you want me to be in the kitchen, yeah. great. Like, let's remember yeah. what the man ha- yeah. had to do, quote unquote, during hey. that time. Hey. So how about you go do that? Yeah. Oh, you can't do that because you don't want to? <laughs> then don't ask me to do this. And I think it's it's important to understand like those power dynamics are still in the back of our minds as men yeah. to some degree, and they're they're seeping in there. And so when you have that power dynamic, you don't want to lose lose it because for some men that's all they have. For mm. some men, all they have is the power over yeah. someone else because they can't get in control of their own emotions. Well, that's the well, and, that's the kind of the ladder of masculinity, right? That's the that's exactly. what we do is you know I and we mm. talk about this a bit in the book. This idea of you know. Uh, you have the 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 mythical alpha, right, and beta, yeah. and and really what it is is you're just finding somebody that you're bigger than and stronger than to abuse or to put down, right, and then that person that you do that to then needs to lift and build his confidence, so then he finds somebody smaller that he can abuse, mm. and then you yeah. have you have essentially this world that we have created for ourselves where, mm. you know, yeah. as men you're just constantly trying to find a place in the world where you feel powerful, where you feel strong yeah. enough, where you feel man enough. But unfortunately, it's coming at the expense of other human beings, men or, men or women, um, or yeah. as we know, a, a lot of trans people. Mm-hmm. Um, but, but finishing off this thread here, uh, I believe deeply in the hurt people hurt people idea. Mm-hmm. And, and, um, and, so, and so many of us, especially men, are, are reliving and re-experiencing our traumas. And then we are, like, like, like we just talked about, we are then um, heal, trying to heal ourselves by exerting power and dominance over other people. So when you feel that rage, which as we know as men is one of the few feelings we are allowed to feel, what do you do with it, right? As somebody who's prone, you now know you're prone to being abusive if you are not in check with yourself and in your heart. I feel that too as a man, like growing up, like I, you know, I didn't have a lot of outlets. And so like I get, I can get angry, right? And I can be sharp with my tongue if I'm not careful. And, you know, I, I, I have never been in a situation where I've wanted, I've hit anybody. However, I can feel that coming like 90 miles an hour. You start to feel it in your, and it's in your fingers. And it's like, it, it just like takes you over, right? It's kind of like venom. 
um, the Super Bowl, yeah. right? What do you do with that? What do you do with yeah. that? For men that are listening, bef before you hit a wall or you hit a person or you or you lash out, what do you do with that anger, Karamo? Well, I, I mean, well, I think there's a step before that I think we always miss in this conversation is that um, if you've had a violent outburst, um, you know, or rage in some way, you know that you're prone to do it again. And so it's about before you do it or before their anger or something before something triggers you of setting up boundaries beforehand. Mm -hmm. And so I think one of the things that you should do, like with, with just in your first step in your intimate relationships with either the person, your, your wife, husband, your kids, whomever, you need to say, hey, I'm prone to being angry. And so if I'm angry or you see it coming up in me, because sometimes people can't recognize it because once the red starts coming, you, see red, you start yeah. to not see it. Yeah. Then you need a physical act that someone can see that they can say, oh my gosh, I'm getting there. And what helps this does is create a boundary. So for instance, um, I have a friend right now who his kids, when he's getting, they getting to tone and they're getting frightened, they put up the number three. Mm -hmm. And it's sort of like, if a number, you know, this is the way they did it with him. It was like, if number one was, you know, you go PP, number two is like the, you know, big boy, number three would like be massive, something's bad. Mm. And so they say three, they just, they just do this. And that's his cue to know we've set a boundary as a family that once you get to three in my eyes, again, because this is, it's violence is how they receive it. And so you have to understand that if, it, if when you're violent to yourself, that's one conversation. But when you're violent or um, angry, it goes out to the world. So the, it's really the world's response to you. Again, that thing we wow. talk about intention impact. And so when they put up the letter number three, it creates this boundary so he can physically see in the red, like, I need to stop. Wow. And I think that was key for me as well with people saying, like, I trust you enough to know that I want to be better. So if my actions are starting to affect you or hurt you in any way, just give me a sign that mm -hmm. I can clearly understand. Now that we've set that boundary, once I see that I'm affecting you, I now then have to figure out what it is. And for me, it was always like, this is where I take a walk or I take a run. And so I would literally just be like, I see a signal that I'm hurting someone, time for me to go out the door. And this means now that we set this boundary before, you don't chase after me. You mm -hmm. don't ask right. me more questions. You don't do anything because now, I'm trying to respect the boundary, which means I depart, you depart. I need to go handle myself. Wow. And for me, it was always walking, running. Um, I, I don't recommend doing things that are violent in essence to get rid of violence. Like, like going to so, hit a punching bag as an example. Punching bag. Yeah. I, I just, I just never understood that. Like right. why reinforce violence with doing something that's violent violence. to an inanimate object? Because what could potentially happen is that you could then uh. see someone as not as a human, and then you're going to be violent to them. And this is where sometimes we see um, violence against certain marginalized communities because we've already dehumanized them in our minds. So you start to say, well, you're not a human to me. When I get mad, I know not to hit this person, but I, you're not a person to me, so I can hit you because when I get mad, I go hit this punching wow. bag. So it's I, like, I just, I just, that just rocked my world. I feel like a really shitty father right now because I just, I, I, I just, my, you know, my boy's three and he's starting yeah. to hit and kick and he's been hit, hitting and kicking his mama. And I just maybe a week ago was like, okay, we're going to hit our pillow. Mm. <laughs> yeah. And now I'm like, what did I just do? Now I yeah. got, I'm like, what? It's okay. He's gotta, three. He's three. There's time. Yeah. He's three. You can three. reverse. So now, and, and you're not, and, and, you're not and, and again, this is, you're not a bad father or anything. This is just, yeah. this is my opinion. No, and it's my genius. It makes world. perfect yeah. sense. Yeah. Right. It makes absolute you know I mean? perfect sense. Why? Mm. You can't, you, yeah, we, we don't need to go hit something when we're angry, mm. especially if we're prone to violence. It's just so simple. Yeah, yeah I get it. Yeah. exactly. And, and I think a big piece, again, that I want the audience to hear is the dehumanization. Yeah, we dehumanize certain communities. And then yeah. therefore, if, if I've been taught to hit an inanimate object like a pillow that is not a human, if I don't see this person as a human being, then of course I'm going to be okay with hitting them. Mm -hmm. And I think we, we forget that our brain can connect those parallels for us. Yeah. They'll be like, oh, these connect. This is not human. You're not human. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to hit you. Mm -hmm. So it's about the boundary first that you set beforehand, respecting the boundary by walking away and doing something to get that energy out. Third, coming back and looking at what you did and reflecting on it for yourself. And then fourth, involving the people that you were violent towards and saying, this is how I reflected upon it. How can 
How did it make you feel so that we can grow through it? And I think those are the four steps for me that allowed me to not be abusive anymore. And that's really important because you, there's no shortcut is really what you're saying. None. And, and I can speak for myself, but as a man, oftentimes we can look for the shortcut, right? Yeah. It's the, it's the like, what's the fastest way for me to get ripped? What's the fastest way for me to lose weight and get a six pack? What's the fastest way for me to learn something, right? We're, we're living in this on-demand society, but what we yeah. keep coming back to is as human beings in general, you got to do the work. There's it's work here. Preach. So if you're somebody who's prone to abuse or emotional abuse, or if you were abused and you're you're reliving that experience in your with your relationships, you have to do the work. There's no shortcut. You don't get yeah. to just like tweet an apology, yeah. right? It's nope. no. What are you doing? And I think and that's kind of the key is like this idea of redemption. It, it requires work. You know, if you don't want to be labeled an abuser, then do the work, yeah, exactly. right? Do the work. Because what yeah. so because so, you're living proof that you're not always going to be that so long as you're willing to do the work. Those four steps were really, really yeah. helpful and important. I know that we, I know that we are running low on time because uh, you got a heart out. We're going to have to get you back. Mm -hmm. This is a new thing that we're doing. We're signing off each of our interviews with these rapid fire questions. Welcome to this week's Man Enough podcast, Rapid Fire Questions, presented in partnership with P&G, the maker of brands like Tide, Swiffer, Mr. Clean, Pantene, and Braun. So can we uh Sure, I'm ready. Can we uh can we hit you hard? All right, you ready? Yep. When was the last time you cried? Oh my gosh, this past week every day. I've been an emotional <laughs> wreck. I'm not even joking. My best friend is right here and he is literally being like, "Yes, I've been an emotional." I, let me you know what? Let me reframe that. It's not an emotional wreck. I've just been in two of my emotions and it's been really yes, nice. Yes, there and we it's go. Been really good. Yeah. What, uh give me one thing you cried about. One thing. Oh my gosh, I thought that um, the pressure of feeling like I was going to let my family down of not being able to support them. And so like, because I'm the main breadwinner and so I have all these things I do for everyone else. And like, you know, we live in a society that one thing can mess you up. And I just was like, I can't do, I felt like I was walking on eggshells oh, because yeah. I was scared that something would happen. And then that's my entire family that's affected. And so um, I started crying about it, but then yes. I made it because it worked. Uh, okay. All right, so I want to flash forward, right? Let's just say 70 years, 90 years, you're a ghost at your own funeral. Yeah. You're listening to your sons give your eulogy. Yeah. What do you hope they say about you? Oh, um, right now I'm hoping that they say that they had fun with me. Mm. Um, and I say that because their entire life I was single parent. I had to be strict. I had to keep them on the narrow. I always had to be the one to talk about, you know, what are you doing for school? How, make a plan, plan your future. I always had to be the one that was like always talking about the serious stuff. And now I'm just like, I want you to know that dad is not always serious. That I'm fun. Like, you know, like we can have a good time. We can have a laugh. And um, I think that's what's most important to me because it's also going to show them the balance is that work is great to accomplish, but also connecting with yourself and having fun and laughing and enjoying life because we never know when it's going to end is also important. So I, I hope they say that I had a lot of fun with my dad. Mm, I love that. Okay. Yeah. What's something that everyone likes, but you're like, no, I, I don't, I don't, I don't get this. Yeah. Chocolate would be one. Okay. Um, mm -hmm. um, me men's nipples. I don't understand. <laughs> I don't get it. I don't know why we have them. <laughs> I just yeah, really I don't. don't. I don't either. I don't. We'll we'll uh, look that up. Uh, figure yeah, out just, who's at the bottom. I, we'll, we'll get to the bottom yeah, of it. I just don't know why in this design of like God, like we have them because we don't need them. We don't feed anybody. And also, when guys are like, "Oh, they're so sexy on a guy," I'm like, "No, mm. I don't see it. I don't understand." Mm. Like, <laughs> so anyway. Okay. Okay. Nipples. Um, when was the last time that you apologized to someone? Um, oh, every day, every day. Love that. Um, I, I like, I think, I think it's important to, if there's ever an action that I think or assume could have hurt somebody to apologize immediately. Um, and I'm not somebody who's a people pleaser or overly apologetic. Like, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. But you can, this is the thing. We all have a sense of when we know that we've done something that could be affecting someone. Um, this is what makes me good at my job on Queer Eye. Cause people are always like, how do you get people just to have emotional breakthroughs and cry so quickly? Mm -hmm. And it's because I'm pretty in tune with body language. I'm pretty in tune with, um, 
uh, the words that are being said underneath the words. Mm. Um, I'm pretty in tune. So I can see if something I do makes somebody feel a certain way. Mm. And I'm quick to say, hey, I don't know if that made you feel a way, but I apologize. And I do that because I want it to be, the apology is sort of the key to the open the door to yeah. say, let's talk more. Mm. And sometimes when you can just do that key of apology, that door swings open and people don't feel defensive and they yeah. feel the ability just to say it. So mm -hmm. I say it all the time. Love it's it. like, it's I your, apologize. It's your superpower. It's one of your superpowers. Yeah. All right, yeah. last question. What does it mean to be man enough? There's a statement that I heard the other day. Um, someone say, I don't know who the quote is from, but I, it just really resonated with me, which was um, broken crayons can still color. Mm. And I thought about all the things that have broken me as a man that have made me feel like, I had to be a certain way, act a certain way, um, that I realized that even though I felt broken, I can still color in this, I can still color this world magically in a beautiful, vulnerable way um, because I'm not defined by any of the negative things that have happened to me. I'm not defined by any of these things. So for me to be man enough is to know that I can still keep trying and keep being better day after day. And that's what I meant by that broken crayons can still color. I just think it's just as, as a statement of like, oh my gosh, yeah, things have been rough. I've done wrong, but I can still color and make things beautiful again mm. um, for myself and for others. Karamo, I love you. Hey. Ugh, that was beautiful. I love you guys too. Thank you to our partners at P&G, the makers of brands like Tide, Swiffer, Mr. Clean, Pantene, and Braun for helping to make the Man Enough podcast possible and for sponsoring these fun and real moments with our guests. Hey, man, I know you got a role. I just need to tell you something straight up. Yeah. Um, I'm inspired by you as I'm listening. And I'm imagining the people who are listening. Um, and I'm going to take it to being a black man, all right? Um, for you to be who you are, to take ownership of your transgressions that you acknowledge now, how you were in the past and how you're trying every day to be better. Not that you've arrived, but rather you're still trying this. Also, the fact that you're a gay man who who owns it, who's 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 out straight up, not apologizing for the way you walk when society is always telling you that you're supposed to. Um, Amen. And I'm thinking that my son, who's 18, who's going to watch this, um, I'm thrilled that he gets to watch you. And I'm, oh. real, I'm really, really thrilled about that. I appreciate that. So, indeed, bro. You, you asked the question, when was the last time I cried? I'm, I just got missy oh. right now. Oh, man. So I appreciate that. I really do. I, I take that in. I, I'm thankful because I feel the same way about you all. And um, it feels nice to hear. Yes, I, so thank you. We come back thank and you. hang out with us again? Man, any time you all want. I, all right. I, this was a great conversation. Thank you for the work y'all are doing in the world. It oh, means the man. world. I really, uh, you, were, you were a very special soul. And... Uh, I, I didn't realize we were going to talk so much about the stuff we talked about today. And I think that, you know, God works in very interesting ways. And mm. I think that there's probably Amen. somebody listening that needed to hear that. And who knows, yeah. maybe uh, one or two people that won't be suffering anymore mm. because of it. Yeah. So thank you for your vulnerability and your openness. Karamo, my brother, you are man enough. Yes. Sir. <laughs> yes. Sir. Love that. Thank you. <laughs> all right, bud. Thank you all. Talk to you soon. All right, man. I'll talk to you soon. All right. Bye-bye. Bye. Wow. Yeah. Woof. I feel like I just want to record him and have him as my like morning yes, wake up alarm. Alarm. Yeah. Like and, I just want him mm -hmm. to talk to me and oh, say oh, that. Oh, that is heavy. In my ear. There's a lot behind that one. I just want him. I just want I, like as soon as I wake up in the morning, the alarm goes off and it's him saying, "Justin, you're enough." <laughs> broken crayons can bro color. Broken crayons. <laughs> can <still laughs> crayons. Uh, stick around. The Man Enough podcast will be right back. All right, welcome back to the Man Enough podcast. I'm Justin Baldoni here with my amazing co-host Liz Plank and one of my best friends in the world, Jamie Heath. That was that was wow. that mm. was pretty that was deep. Yeah. And enlightening and uh I honestly had no idea that's where it goes. I mean, first of all, I'm a new podcast host and so we all do our research and I did not expect us to go as deep as we got especially into abuse mm -hmm. and i'll be frank i've never heard another man i've never heard a man admit and talk about it that hit me um in the way that he did yeah and i and that i think that's why i kind of wanted to i know we had a plan for where we wanted you know the fatherhood we want to yeah. talk about fatherhood he's an amazing father he adopted his own mm. um child basically and uh he's done so, so many amazing things but i just i couldn't get off this idea Sweetest of thing 
for me was when, I think, I forget which one of you asked him, when's the last time he said he was sorry? Yeah. And he had said, uh, every day? Every day. That got me, because mm -hmm. that's a man who wants to be better. Yep. Mm -hmm. You know, to reflect, mm -hmm. bring ourselves to account each day, those kind of mm -hmm. concepts. And also when he was admitting that his whole abusive behavior, how he still has to practice days to day mm. reminders to not be that. Mm. Mm. I'm thinking about how if we all did things like that. Right. That really got me. Yeah. And, and I thought it was so revealing for him to say, if you don't have power or control over yourself and over your emotions as a man, you're going to seek to have control over someone else. And that's where the hurt people hurt people, right? But some mm. hurt people don't hurt other people. No, they just hurt, true. right? Very but true. if you're taught that, you're gonna end up hurting other people. Yeah, for sure. I have a question for you, Liz. Uh-oh. No. <laughs> it's a Jamie question. Yeah. <laughs> it should be no, its own no, segment. I'm serious. I'm, uh, my question is, when you hear a conversation like, or not here, when you're a part of a conversation, but listening to two men in this con mm -hmm. context, and then the third one adding me to it. How do you feel that we did with that? What do you think, what did, what was fruitful from it? Other mm -hmm. than just a bunch of guys just talking a little bit. Right. What do you feel? I mean, I think that his reframing of the old, you know, the age old question that we ask so many women who are survivors of domestic violence was so refreshing. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was so powerful because that's how I felt when I was in that situation. And where people told me, you're you're this feminist, you're this, you're such a strong woman. Why would you, you know, mm -hmm. accept this? And I just kept thinking, why did he not let me go? Why did he, you know, seek to stay with someone that he was hurting? And particularly like with domestic violence and intimate violence, you know, we don't think about the fact that, you know, men are hurting, they're not just hurting anyone, they're hurting the person that they say that they love. Mm -hmm. And there's something really just on a spiritual level, um, something really wrong with that. And, and, and yeah, that doesn't sort of make it to that mainstream conversation around domestic violence. So mm -hmm. I thought it was, it was beautiful to hear two men talk about it because we did bring up like domestic violence and abuse and he kind of referenced it, but you went further. You were like, wait, so do you, I, you know, you are just saying that you're an abuser. Like, what does that mean to you? What does healing look like? What does redemption look like? And I've never seen two men have that conversation ever, mm. ever. Um, we do well. I mean, know. these kinds of conversations, I think, are rare in general, which is why someone like Karama, who's such an open book, is, you know, he really was when, as we talked before, and I was like, "What's off limits?" And he said, "Nothing." Yeah. Mm. Um, and I'm very grateful he gave he really gave me that permission um, because, it, you know, there is a little bit of I could I could feel myself being like, "Do I want to go there?" Mm -hmm. You know. Um, but we live in a time where, like, it's you know, I just think about like we li we live in this like clickbait time where you know I people can get labeled as something and and karamo is somebody who has undefined so many of these things and and to go from where he was right fully admitting that he was that to be where he is now like i just think that that's a roadmap that that anybody can do but what he taught us all and the thing i think that was what i take away the most from it is that it takes work you know jamie and i are both baha'is and the baha'i faith abdul baha says little by little day by day mm -hmm. and that's what i got out of that Mm. Which is like, you don't just like wake up one day and you're just, yeah. you know, a new person or saved and suddenly you're no longer an abuser. You no longer, you know, um, you know, will cut somebody with your words. It takes like deep introspective work, mm -hmm. right? Like in the book, we talk about the why ladder, mm. like asking myself why, you know, like when I interrupt my wife or when I say something that's a little hurtful. Which, by the way. You did with Liz. I know, and I, well, I, I, I said Liz, I, and I, I apologized to her when we were off, and I said, "Did I? I'm so sorry if I did." And she goes, "No, no, no," but I, I did, and uh, and so I apologize for that. But what well. you did well, and I'm cutting you off. I'm sorry. What you did well when I addressed you <laughs> this, this afterwards, is the cutoff train. <laughs> when, when I addressed you, and I had said, um, "Be mindful of not cutting off Liz." What I, what I appreciate about you said, "Oh, did I do that?" And then you want to make the adjustment. You didn't have to pretend and hide. Like, no, I didn't. Which is exactly what Karamo said. The idea that when someone apologizes or when you do something wrong, just like say, I'm sorry, don't excuse it, nothing else. So you did cut off Liz. Well, half the time, half the, and, and, and this is what's so weird about being a man is that we walk through the world and half the time we do shit we don't even realize we're doing. So like, when you, like when you were like, hey, just be mindful of that, I was like, Shh, did I? Oh my God. That's the, I think that's the thing about privilege is like you're not aware, you're, you're, mm -hmm. you're ignorant to your own um, actions like when you talk over people. So it starts with us. 
Mm-hmm. It starts right here. It starts right now. Started with Karamo today. Started with Karamo. Um, and it's going gonna, it's gonna to carry on through our children and through our friends. And I think that's the beauty. That's like one of the cool things about masculinity is that because we model, like we, because we learn masculinity from other men because like it's it's not in us it's a it's a in so many ways a performance it's something that we pick up it's a it's cues it's we see something in someone else and we're like oh we want to you know we want to put that into our like little bag of tricks that means that we can also adapt and change it means that it means that you know if if suddenly you know you have LeBron James and Karamo and all of these you know amazing people and you know very famous people like The Rock talking about you know crying or or being a father and things that means that it suddenly becomes cool we get to take Mm -hmm. those bag of tricks and we put them in and we get to model them and do them ourselves and i hope that this podcast um in some ways can help someone who is listening um feel comfortable adapting and bringing and 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 changing some of their behaviors and putting them in their pocket saying you know i want to do that or wow i'm gonna i'm gonna i'm gonna take what caramel said and i'm gonna apply it to my life Mm -hmm. or i want to be more like jamie because we all we all want to be be more more like jamie Jamie. oh yeah right (laughs) Uh, with that, thank you so much for listening to the Man Enough Podcast. I'm Justin Baldoni. I am Liz Plank. And I am Jamie Heath. Yeah. And uh, if you like the show, please comment, uh, like, subscribe to wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts. And as always, you can follow me, Justin Baldoni, on Instagram, TikTok, Twitter, Facebook. And where can we follow you, Liz Plank? All those places. All those too. places. Yes. And Jamie. And you can follow, <laughs> where follow are you? me. I've got about seven followers. <laughs> so go to. <laughs> That's going to change. Just you know. Everybody should be that following. Everybody oh, should God. be following, Jamie. Yes. Uh, thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. Uh, this was fun. Love it. Yeah. Beautiful. You're enough. Mm-hmm. You're enough. You're enough. If you're, you're listening enough. to this, remember, mm-hmm. you Liz, are enough. You mm-hmm. always have been enough. You've always been enough. Oh, stop it. <laughs> Cue the music. <laughs> <laughs>